I'm going to be presenting our work on pharma leaks, or as I like to call it, um, Rogue Pharmacy Economics 101. So as you can see, we collaborated with a good number of people. The interesting collaborator is Brian Krebs. He's a journalist. He does a lot of investigative reporting on cybercrime, and he focuses a lot on the pharmacy affiliate program business model. And if you're interested in this subject, he, had, he maintains a very interesting blog that you should read to get even more details on this subject. So let me give you quickly some context as to what these online pharmaceutical drug programs are. So perhaps anyone that's clicked on a um, spam advertised link, there's a high probability that you've seen a storefront similar to this one, hawking online pharmaceuticals, mostly ED pills, and all without prescriptions at discounted prices. So most people have probably seen this, but let me take a step back and show you the actual players involved in this economy. So there's three main players in this economy. There's the user, which is the potential customer. There's the affiliate marketer, which is typically a spammer. And there's the affiliate program. And let me go into a concrete example of a business interaction between these three parties. So initially what happens is that the affiliate marketer perhaps gets the user to see some kind of spam advertisement that includes some kind of link, that includes some kind of you know, enticement of cheap drugs, no prescriptions required, to get the user to click on this. If the user is actually interested in perhaps buying these pharmaceuticals, clicks on it, they'll be delivered that template that I showed you in the original slide. And the user can interact with this template just as with a normal you know, e-commerce site. They can, there's a wide selection of drugs there. They can select their drugs. If they indeed want to purchase some drugs from the site, then at this point in time, the relationship switches from the affiliate, whose job it is to attract customers, to the affiliate program, whose job it is to actually monetize the customer and turn them into money. So at this point in time, the spammer fades out, the affiliate program steps in, and if the user decides to purchase this, typically purchases happen with credit cards, the user gives their credit card details to the affiliate program. And the affiliate program, as you'll see in the rest of this talk, actually operates much like a business. And their job is to process these credit cards, and then they'll actually deliver some product that you ordered. So this isn't a complete scam. These pharmacy affiliate programs, as I'll show you, operate much like a business. And they're very interested in keeping their customers happy and satisfied because these customers are paying with credit cards. If they're not satisfied customers, they're going to charge back. These affiliate programs will be shortly out of business. And as I'll show you from the economics, these affiliate programs are in it for the long haul, and they want to scale their business to large millions of dollars. So it's not in their interest to have dissatisfied customers. So quickly here, the pharmaceutical affiliate business this is one of the largest sectors of how to monetize spam. As shown by our previous study, two years at Oakland, um, a large fraction of the spam emails map back to one of these kinds of online pharmaceutical programs. And so spammers see this as a very lucrative way to monetize spam. And our studies, we feel that we come at the approach of fighting spam that it's very important to actually understand the business of these spammers and to try and identify potentially fragile parts of their business that perhaps we can maybe undermine to make them much less profitable or perhaps drive them completely out of business if we can disrupt some fragile part of their business. So the goals of this study are to characterize some of the key aspects of these pharmaceutical affiliate programs. So just quickly, let me go more concretely into what exactly these pharmaceutical affiliate programs are and what they're responsible for for people that are unfamiliar with them. So these online pharmaceutical affiliate programs essentially have to maintain three key relationships. They have to maintain good relationships with their affiliates, the spammers, because if they don't maintain good relationships, then they're not going to be driven customers to drive larger and larger sales from them. They also need to maintain good relationships with suppliers and shippers to deliver their goods to keep the customers happy to stay in business. They also need to maintain relationships with payment processors. This is probably one of the key components of their business. If one of these relationships falters with these payment providers, they can no longer accept payments. They're no longer making revenue. They can no longer pay the rest of their people, and their business will quickly fold, and they'll go out of business. So as I'm going to hammer home in most of this talk, 
these affiliate programs operate much like any other business do. So quickly, in Pharmalytics, in previous studies, a lot of people have, including our group, have inferred just small little parts of these online businesses. And it's always been unclear as to how accurate these inferences are. And we've only gotten tiny little pieces of the business that we can infer. However, in PharmaLeaks, we've had the fortuitous events of getting a large corpus of actual ground truth data that's been leaked from a few subset of these online pharmaceutical programs. And with this ground truth data, we can do a far more detailed analysis than any other analysis of how these businesses operate and the dynamics of these three key players, the customers, the affiliates, and the affiliate programs, and understand a lot how this business functions and understand their fragile parts of their business deeper. So let me just quickly go into detail about what this leaked corpus looks like. So as part of this leaked data set, we have numerous leaked data sources of financial operational information from three separate affiliate programs. A lot of this information leaked because of an uh, ongoing rivalry between two um, of these spam operators, and they tend to get pissed off at each other. They'll somehow obtain some information. They'll leak it sometimes widely just on the Internet, sometimes a little bit less broadly to a large set of law enforcement and reporters just to say that the other people are really bad and you should lock them up and put them out of business. And then in, in retaliation, the other operator will in turn do the same thing to them. So we receive the windfall of this kind of rivalry. And as part of this, we have um, the back-end database, which includes order information, transactional information, a very rich set of information on the GlabMed Spamit programs, which are two of the larger online affiliate programs, according to when we did our analysis of spam and linked it back to the different pharmaceutical affiliate programs. We also have chat logs from the operators of the GlabMed Spammer program, which again give us a lot of metadata and insight into how their business operates. We have a, a more restricted set of transactional information from the Arcs Promotion Affiliate Program, again an extremely major online affiliate program that constituted a large portion of spam while they were operating. And we also have extremely um, fine-grained revenue and cost structure information from the Arcs Promotion data set. So just a quick summary of this data, it encompasses over $185 million worth of revenue of purchases, it encompasses over a million customers, over 1.5 million orders, and over 2,600 affiliates. During our analysis of this data, we realized that um, GlabMed has often denied that they are the operators of Spamit. However, by our analysis of the databases of GlabMed and Spamit, we realize that Spamit is just a fork of the GlabMed databases, and that in fact these two are operated by the same people. And also our RX promotion transactional data, as I said, was somewhat limited. It's limited to U.S. customers. Luckily, U.S. customers make up the majority of the customers, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. So we get a fairly detailed picture of RX promotions from this limited transactional data. So now let's delve into the first player in this spam economy, which is the customer. So a quick rundown of the demographics of their customer base. So as you can see, majority of it is from the U.S., then a smattering from Western Europe, Canada, Australia. All told, 95% of the customers are from those four locations. This largely confirms what we presented last year at Usenix Security when we inferred from some web logs the composition, the demographics of the customers. So um, next, now that we know the demographics of the customers, let's look at what these customers are buying. So as this um, ironically shaped graph shows, <laughs> as, as you might suspect, they, they don't put the Viagra and the Cialis on the front page for no particular reason. That is, in fact, the, the large share of what they're selling is the ED pills. And they're selling them to a largely male demographic. They also, as you can see from this graph, sell other, they have a large formulary of things that they sell. And they do, they do sell a small fraction of those things also. It, it depends on the formulary. Some pharmacies sell more of the things and less of the ED, depending on the formulary that they carry. 
but this is the case for Spamin and Gladman. And in fact, 75% of the orders, 80% of the revenue for the Gladman Spamin program are derived from the ED medications. Um, now let's take a quick look at ARC's promotions, which had a slightly different formula. So here's the revenue structure for our promotions. We couldn't get the demographics. So the data set wasn't rich enough to figure out the demographics for the ARCH promotion. Um, here you can see this kind of interesting kind of tooth graph, right? And as you can see, they, they derive a little bit more of the revenue from the pain medications. You can read the paper to figure out the details on this. They derive a lot of their revenue from the ED. But in the middle of this graph, you can see on the x-axis is time moving forward on the y-axis is their revenue numbers derived from each product. In the middle, you can see this sharp fall-off in their revenue. This sharp revenue fall-off was caused by them losing a relationship with one of their um, payment processors. They accepted visa payments for a certain class of drugs. You can see the class of drugs that fell out of their revenue. And as you can see, this disruption in their payment processing caused their revenue to almost have at this period and at the beginning of this disruption they in fact became unprofitable and it takes them about two to three months to reestablish this payment processing relationship so as you can see when a program incurs this kind of payment processing disruption this has a huge negative impact on the profitability of these businesses so this kind of jives with some of our findings from two years ago at Oakland where we mapped out the banking relationships between these programs. This is indeed a fragile, hard to replace portion of their business. Okay, so now that we've looked at product demand and demographics, let's take a look at how these programs attract new customers. So on the y-axis there is the number of new customers that the program attracts in the, by the hundred thousands. On the x-axis is time moving along. So Gladman and Spamit have a very similar shaped curve. It's, it's somewhat regular. They, they have a consistently new stream of customers coming in. And RX Promotions has a similar kind of linear trend of this constant stream of new customers coming in. And if you crunch the numbers, the Gladman and Spamit programs attract about 3,500 new customers per week, and the RX Promotions program attracts about 1,500 hundred new customers per week. So I think that this is possibly the most interesting result of this paper. And it's interesting because it shows that this market for online pharmaceuticals isn't saturated. In fact, they're constantly gaining new customers at this rate. And I think that this explains a lot of the behavior of the affiliates, the spammers, and why the spammers want to make sure that everyone on the entire U.S. gets spam email advertising these pharmaceuticals because in fact it's effective and it works and they continually gain new customers doing this kind of behavior so this kind of behavior is profitable for the affiliates so they're going to continue to do this kind of behavior because indeed this market isn't saturated they're constantly finding a new stream of customers and that kind of advertising works so now that we've kind of looked at the customer demographics let's switch to the affiliates and somewhat of how they operate. So here's a quick breakdown of the revenue of the affiliate. So on the y-axis is the percentage of revenue for the affiliate program that kind of each affiliate contributes. And on the x-axis is the percentage of affiliates that it takes to achieve that percentage of revenue for the affiliate program. So as you can see from the x-axis, that's a log plot. And so just like every, just like other kinds of multi-level marketing schemes, there's a few number of very successful affiliates, and there's a large number of affiliates that are not so successful. A lot of them just completely fail at trying to be affiliates for these online pharmaceutical markets. And in fact, 10% of the affiliates account for about 80% of the total program revenue across all three programs. So this is another somewhat interesting finding and potentially another bottleneck. It seems that there's, there's just a few number of very successful affiliates driving a lot of their sales. So if we could potentially find some way, possibly legally, to disrupt this 10% of affiliates that do a really good job of earning for these programs, perhaps that's another way to undermine them and cause them to be far less profitable, if we could figure out some way to disrupt these power affiliates. So let's look at these affiliate commissions in a slightly different way. So in this graph, on the y-axis is the density, 
on the x-axis is the estimated annual commission rate for the different affiliates. So Gladman Arc's promotions have kind of a similar curve here, and Spamit has kind of this bimodal distribution. By the way, the little um, dots on the lines are the median income, annual income for an affiliate. So as you can see for GlabMed and Arch Promotions, it's about $350. For Spamit with the bimodal distribution, it's about $500 in one of the modes and about $30,000 in the other mode. Quickly to explain why um, GlabMed and Arch Promotions kind of follow the same curve, they're a type of affiliate program that's termed an open affiliate program meaning that they don't really do a lot of screening of their affiliates. They'll let pretty much anyone walk in and try and be an affiliate for them. And that's, that's somewhat of the beauty of the affiliate-affiliate program structure, is that the affiliate program doesn't really incur much cost in allowing more affiliates to join the program because the affiliates only get paid on a commission basis. So if the affiliate's unsuccessful, they don't get paid. There's no real risk associated with bringing in new affiliates. And the affiliate program has this difficult problem, right, that it's hard to tell a priori who are the good affiliates, who are the good spammers that will drive in lots of traffic to your site. So by being an open program, you can just let them all try their hand at being affiliates for your program. A lot of them, again, as this graph shows, are going to fail. Some of them, at the long tail, are going to succeed brilliantly. And spam it was more of what they term a closed program where they did a lot more background check due diligence. You either had to be vouched by someone else that was a good affiliate, or you had to have some kind of record of being a good affiliate yourself. And indeed, this shows that that does a better job of attracting the, the power affiliates to your program. But again, still, it's difficult a priori to tell who are going to be the successful affiliates for your program, even when you do all this due diligence and screening. So these are just the quick numbers, and as you can see, there's just this large failure rate, as in most multi-level marketing schemes. So now that we've looked at the affiliates, let's look at some of the more top-earning affiliates here. So on the high end of things, let's look at some of the schemes that these, high, that these top-earning affiliates use to be successful spammers. So an obvious one to think of is, right, run a large bot network and spew out a whole bunch of spam. So in fact, the operator of Rootstock, we identified him within the spam at data set. And in fact, he made close to $2 million by operating Rootstock and sending out spam shilling for the GlabMed spam it program. So that indeed is a very um, good way of becoming a successful marketer is run a large bot network. Another way of doing it, we isolated an affiliate called Scorp2. Scorp2 earned about $3 million However, SCORP2, from an analysis of the refer headers, appears to have rented out multiple bot networks. And perhaps rented out or perhaps um, bought code from different botnet writers and maybe operated his own version of each one of these bot networks. It's somewhat unclear. But he didn't just operate one bot network like the Roostock people. However, if you dig deeper and do a a more in-depth analysis, you can see that actually the largest overall earner of all of our data was an affiliate named WebPlanet. And this affiliate appears to have not used spam email, but in fact used web-based advertising to earn um, on the order of $4.6 million. So it's one of these interesting questions I think of, what is the optimal st strategy for spamming? And also these are gross revenue for these spammers. And Unfortunately, our leaked data set doesn't offer much insight into what are the actual profits of these spammers, because in fact, these spammers have a lot of the costs themselves, as we'll show you in the case of the affiliate programs. This, they're not making all this money in profit. There's some expenses incurred in spamming this much. But unfortunately, the data sets that we have don't answer this question. So I think that this is a really interesting open question that's remaining. So as you can see, these top earners, they earn quite a bit of money. And they, in fact, earn the largest share of each individual sale. However, the affiliate programs, if the affiliate programs are very successful, they, in fact, can earn more by taking a smaller portion of each sale over all of the sales from their affiliate program than the individual affiliates. So as I said, the affiliate programs, they operate very much like a business. Here is the spreadsheet from Arch Promotions that has their fine-grained accounting data. This accounting data actually conforms to international 
financial um, accounting records. And as you can see, it's extremely detailed. Gives us a very fine-grained look at their profits, their gross revenue, and their costs. So using this and other transactional data, we can get a very good handle on the cost structure of these affiliate programs. So very quickly, let's go over the direct cost first. So by direct cost, these are costs that occur every time that a purchase occurs. So if we look at this again, right, as I said before, the, the affiliates earn the largest portion of each individual sales. They earn commissions upwards of 30 to 45 percent. If it's a very successful affiliate, they can negotiate larger commission rates, showing that there's a limited number of these very successful affiliates, and the affiliate programs compete by offering them larger and larger portions of the sale as commissions. So in the chat logs, we can see the different operators competing for these top affiliates and cutting deals to give them more and more commissions. Um, next is the suppliers. The interesting thing here is that if you see that line, shipping actually is a larger cost to them than the actual cost of the drugs. So shipping is about 11 to 12 percent of their cost. Supply is about um, 6 to 7 percent of their cost. In total, it's about 8 percent of their cost. And then processing, paying to process the visa cards is about 10 percent of their cost. And they're left this is probably a very um, optimistic estimate of a profit, so about 30%. However, as I'll show you in the next slide, these are just the direct costs. They also have indirect costs associated with their business. So if we look at some of the more fine-grained cost structure of the ARCS promotions program, we can see that right they have this direct cost of about 70%, but they also have this indirect cost of about 13% of their revenues. This um, indirect cost is things like, you know, people's salaries. Um, there's things like lobbying their governments, marketing. Marketing, in this sense, means attracting affiliates to be part of their program, is that part of their marketing budget. And a lot of these costs are somewhat fixed. So even though GlabMed was doing a lot more sales and arts promotions, a lot of these indirect costs seem to be the same across these programs, suggesting that they're somewhat fixed. And again, argues that they want to have this economy of scale to try and negate out this indirect cost. So, okay. so this um, leaves them with probably a more accurate estimate of about 16% of is the profit, is the profit that they're actually making off of this business. And this jives about with the chat logs when the GlabMed Spamit operators report about 10 to 20% when they're talking with the affiliates about their cost structure. So now that we've looked at the cost structure, let's quickly look at the payment service providers. So quickly how to read this figure is that each one of those abbreviations represents a different payment service provider. Um, each row represents a different account that they've established with that payment service provider. Sometimes they establish multiple accounts to get redundancy in case one account is shut down, they have other accounts to fall back on. So as you can see from this graph, there's very few of these over the course of the over three years of data that we have. And let me quickly point out some interesting events. Oh, by the way, um, the size of those dots represents how much revenue was um, processed through each one of those accounts. So the larger the dot, the more revenue was processed through that account. So quickly to point out some events. In that line right there, that kind of represents the souring of the relationship with LV. And because of this relationship souring with LV, who they had used to process the majority of their payments, they had to push more of their processing onto LT and GL, which were the two other main payment service providers that they did. If you look more forward in time, you can see that the relationship completely sours with LV, it sours with LT. They're left with only a single payment processor, GL, that they have to use to process all of their transactions. And then if we look forward in time, their, re their relationship with GL sours. And just as in the case with um, Arch Promotions, when they lost their banking relationship, their revenue sharply declines. Extending further out, we have metadata that shows that they strike a deal with another payment service provider. They agree to much less favorable terms. They have to pay much more than the 10% typically required. And thus, they're becoming less and less profitable because of these disruptions in their payment processing service. This is becoming more and more of a direct cost to them. So this kind of jives with our study two years ago at Oakland that shows that these three payment service providers accounted for about 
85% of the transactions. So quickly, let me give you a quick epilogue of where these programs stand currently. Um, about two weeks ago on the GlabMed forum, the operators posted this message. I don't speak very good Russian. Luckily, one of my co-authors translated this for me. So just quickly, it says they're having problems with their processing. They can't accept any new orders. And effectively, they have to cease operations until they find a new um, payment service provider that will process their transactions. A similar fate happened to Arcs Promotions. They had only a single payment service provider. That relationship soured, and in fact, they're out of business currently. So just to quickly conclude, the small number of advertising affiliates that generate most of the revenue. This market is not saturated. The affiliate programs have substantial costs. They have a very thin profit margin. If things go bad, like their payment service provider squeezes them for more of a share of the money, that drives them to be less and less profitable. When there's financial disruptions, their indirect costs become a larger burden on them. They become unprofitable. And these three payment service providers were responsible for a majority of the transactions for GlabMed. So indeed, this is a fragile part of their business that's, when it's disrupted, costs them a lot of headaches. So thank you and questions. All right. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Damon. Uh, again, if you have questions, please line up at one of the two mics. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ian Goldberg. Uh, please identify yourself and state your affiliation. Thank you. I've apparently been identified. Ian Goldberg, University of Waterloo. So uh, uh, on, your, on the spreadsheet you showed, I thought it was particularly poignant that they had a line item for fines, which was pretty funny. Um, but I want to ask about the graph that showed new weekly uh, customers. Can you flip back to that? That one, yep. So is this new weekly customers? So they're getting like every yes. week they get more and more new customers? Yes. So it's expen like quadratically this increasing? Well, keep in mind, um, I didn't go into this. This is in the paper, but they get about 30% reorders. So this is just the new customers that they're attracting. So at the left of the graph, they're getting like 1,000, 100,000. It's, it's not really exponential. It's just linear. No, no. But is that the total number of customers or the number of new customers? That's the number of new customers weekly. Okay. So it, it's a cumulative number. No? Sorry. It, okay, it's, it's a cumulative. So this, no, they're not exponentially getting customers. It's a linear attraction of customers. So they get the same number of customers yes. every week. Okay, yes. so this is the total number of customers. No, it's not an exponentially growing business. Right, okay. Right. Good. Okay, we have a lot of questions in only two minutes. We'll go into the front now. now name and affiliation, please. Uh, Adam Langley, Google. These folks seem really desperate. Is Bitcoin just too funky for their customers to cope with? Um, yeah, as the transaction numbers showed, about 95% of their transactions were cleared through, you know, Visa, MasterCard, Open Loop, credit card things. They had about 5% that were e-checking, but it doesn't seem like customers are very interested in using anything but credit cards. Probably, looking at their customer base, that's what they're familiar with paying with. All right. Uh, Dave, Dave Wagner, UC Berkeley. Uh, Great talk, thank you. I wonder if this sheds any light on um, policy about uh, uh, legitimate access to, to drugs um, in, in, the, in the US or these top countries. So if you want to take the extreme version, if you look at prohibition, one of the lessons from prohibition was that if you restrict access to something that everyone wants, then the consequence is that that drives that activity underground and you get smuggling and crime and so on. Uh, do you think this is a less extreme version of that where where um, there's, a, there's a hidden cost of restricting access to drugs that people want, which is that it drives spam and uh, un sleazy underground cyber criminals and stuff like that on the internet, and can you quantify that, and do you think this has any implications for policy? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think our data really has any interesting things to shed on that. In our previous study, we found that in the U.S. and places with poor health care, that the, the distribution of the, the non-ED you know, kind of recreational drugs, the more drugs for what con chronic conditions, you know, like cancer meds and stuff like that were higher. But in fact, when we did our analysis of this product, it didn't really support that. So it's kind of, it's a fuzzy question. Okay, uh, just time for 
two quick more questions. Okay, Mike Freeman Princeton, it's a follow on to David Julie. I, I was wondering if you, you talked about this being mostly about the US, if you looked at any countries like Canada or something where, I guess my question is, are some of these things like ED driven by cost or driven by access or to healthcare embarrassment where if the actually cost of buying these prescription goods go down, you actually saw less reliance on these online venues? Um, like, like I said before, we saw a different distribution, but in this current study, we didn't really see a, a different distribution between, you know, poor countries with better health care, countries with worse health care. I think a lot of it might just be embarrassment. You're right. The, these drugs are heavily discounted also. These, I, I think we have some analysis in our paper. You know, you, they sell these drugs for about a dollar a pill, whereas at a legitimate pharmacy, they're about $20 a pill. So there's this really steep discount on these drugs. So I think that all of these are factors on why they turn to these sources. One final quick question. Ben Lushitz, Microsoft Research. So this is a very exciting talk, but the monetary amounts you mentioned are really small in the grand scheme of things. I mean, this is a few million, you know, millions a year, right? So uh, yet they generate a lot of spam. So the question is, can't we just pay them off? <laughs> Clearly, it costs us a lot more to fight this than they're making off of doing this bad stuff. But of course, the problem with that is if, if you start paying people, then more people line up <laughs> to get payments. So it's, it's always a difficult balance. See, you can probably say that about almost all crime, that of course the costs of fighting it are more than the criminals actually make. All right, thank you, David. Uh